Today, I will cover the creation of crystal structures by adding atoms or groups of atoms to each lattice point. We will look at shapes and the symmetries associated with those shapes. And you might be amazed at how, by just looking at the macroscopic shape, we can work out which crystal class that particular crystal belongs to, whether that's uh, triclinic or orthorhombic or cubic. Imagine that we have this as the projection of the primitive cubic lattice. In other words, uh, this is how uh, the projection would look on the basal plane with these lattice points located at heights zero and one. So, so far, this is just an imaginary cubic lattice, which has just one lattice point per cell, and therefore it's known as primitive. Now, once I start to put atoms on a particular lattice point, I've got to do that for every single lattice point, because the definition of a lattice point is that the environment around that point is identical, no matter which lattice point you observe. So, here I'm putting a red and a blue atom. So the blue atom is located at zero and one, and the red atom is located at the body center at a height half. So I've put a pair of atoms associated with this lattice point. I've now got to repeat this for every single lattice point. So here we go. Another pair of atoms, another pair of atoms, and another pair of atoms. Now, this is not body-centered cubic because this is a different atom from this. This is primitive cubic with two atoms per lattice point. Okay. So in this structure, we have two different atoms forming the motif that we place at every single lattice point. And it turns out that this is actually the structure of brass, beta brass, where you have copper atoms at the corners and a zinc atom in the center of the cube. Of course, you can also have zinc atoms at the corners and the copper atom at the cube, depending on where you define the origin of the unit cell. So this is the crystal structure of brass, copper zinc, uh, and it is a primitive cubic lattice with a motif of a copper atom at zero, 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 and a zinc atom at a half, half, half. So, a crystal structure is defined by taking the lattice and placing a motif at every single lattice point and that generates the actual crystal structure. And of course, this is why we can buy many varieties of wallpapers because in the last lecture I explained to you, there are only five different ways in arrange, of arranging a periodic array of points in two dimensions. But if you place a flower at each lattice point, then of course we see a different pattern uh, from if we place the B at every lattice point. So you can buy a much larger variety of wallpapers than uh, implied by the five um, two-dimensional lattices, Brave lattices. So a primitive cubic lattice of brass has a motif of a copper atom at zero, 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 and a zinc atom at a half, half, half. Now, here we have just two atoms per lattice point, but you will see later that we can place a whole cluster of atoms at each lattice point, but the basic formula remains the same. Pick one of the 14 Brave lattices and then add atoms, the same group of atoms in the same arrangement at every single lattice point. We now have a projection of the face-centered cubic unit cell, where we have um, lattice points located at zero and one, and also on the face centers uh, here on the projection is at a height half. If I now place a carbon atom, uh, a pair of carbon atoms, one located at zero, 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 and another one located at a quarter, quarter, quarter at each one of these lattice points, then I will generate this crystal structure of diamond. So here, I placed a pair of carbon atoms at this particular lattice point here, 
So now I've got to repeat this for every single lattice point uh, in, in this cell. Uh, so this is at zero, 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 and this is at a quarter, quarter, quarter. Since the lattice point here was at a height half, uh, this carbon atom is located at the face center, and this one is at a height three quarters, but a quarter relative to the one at half. So I repeat this for every single lattice point, and that is the crystal structure of diamond. Okay, so diamond is pure carbon, but the atoms are arranged uh, in this in this form, which gives it the bonding and the hardness that we associate associate with diamond. So in three dimensions, this is the crystal structure, and each carbon atom is tetrahedrally bonded to every other carbon atom. These bonds are incredibly strong and that's why there's almost no capacity for plastic deformation in this system. So um, if you look at uh, this 3D diagram, it's now becoming more difficult to visualize it, whereas in the projection everything is really quite clear. Now, when we draw a projection, it's sometimes useful to draw a set of four unit cells, for example here, because it makes it easier to identify certain elements of symmetry. So, for example, there is a center of symmetry located at a height one eighth, uh, and the other coordinates are also one eighth and one eighth. That means if I take this carbon atom, invert it through the one eight, then I get a carbon atom at zero. Okay, and you, you can try that symmetry operation for every single atom and it will work. So the centers of symmetry are located at one eight, one eight, one eight, uh, and the equivalent positions in the cell. So by drawing four of these cells together, it becomes easier to identify certain symmetry elements. Okay, uh, let's uh, continue. Uh, again, we have a face-centered cubic lattice, but this time, instead of all the atoms being identical, as in the case of uh, diamond, we will place a motif of a zinc atom at zero, 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 and a sulfur atom at a quarter, quarter, quarter. So this is the zinc sulfide crystal structure, which if all these atoms were identical, would be exactly the same as that of diamond in terms of the arrangement of atoms, but of course the bonding will be um, different because zinc, for example, is a metal. And metals you can deform without breaking the bonds because the metallic bonds bond extends over all the atoms. So this is the crystal structure of zinc sulfide, similar to diamond, except now we are placing two different atoms at each lattice point. And in three dimensions, the zinc sulfide structure would look like this. And this particular material is a candidate for ultraviolet light emitting diodes. And the reason for, one reason for making such diodes is that ultraviolet light destroys bacteria in water. So it could be a simple way of purifying water from bacteria. This is, uh, Similar, uh, except now we are dealing with uh, gallium atoms at zero, 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 and nitrogen atoms at a quarter, quarter, quarter. So this is a, a gallium atom at zero, 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 and nitrogen atom at a quarter, quarter, quarter. Now, gallium nitride uh, is used extensively in light emitting diodes, but the form that's used is hexagonal gallium nitride. Uh, we'll deal with that late in a later lecture. This is the cubic form of gallium nitride, which is not the most stable form, and therefore it has to be grown by depositing it epitaxially on a variety of substrates. And the reason why, uh, one reason why it's being researched is that the problem with the hexagonal form of gallium nitride is that the green LED is not very efficient, you know. So it, it, you only convert about half the energy into light. 
uh, the potential for getting a higher efficiency green LED is higher with the cubic gallium nitride. If you want to learn more, this is a literature review by one of the PhD students in our department, which is really quite nice uh, to get a grasp of the green wavelength problem. Okay, um, this is calcium fluoride. And in this case, we have a calcium atom at zero, zero, zero and two fluorine atoms, one at a quarter height and the other one at three quarters height. So there's a cluster of three atoms placed at every single lattice point. So the formula is uh, CaF2 in this case. And notice that the crystals of fluorite, calcium fluoride, are really quite beautiful to look at, but they have a cubic shape reflecting the symmetry of the crystal structure. And uh, calcium fluoride is mined for many purposes, but one is that it's a source of fluorine and it's also used as a flux in the process uh, for manufacturing aluminum from its uh, oxides. Three-dimensional structure, much more complicated because we now have uh, three uh, atoms in the motif that we place at every single lattice point of the cubic F that is, and this is another picture of um, calcium fluoride, and you can very clearly see that the crystals form in this lovely cubic shape, uh, and therefore we can immediately say that there are, you know, without going into any characterization, uh, high resolution characterization, we know that there are four triads along the body diagonals of the cube, and therefore this must belong to the cubic crystal class. Now there is um, in the first lecture, a slide showing the turbine blade that goes into aero engines, uh, the hottest part of the aero engine. And that uh, I explained to you is made from a nickel based super alloy in which uh, one, uh, one of the critical alloying elements is aluminum because nickel and aluminum combine to form a compound called gamma prime. And when, uh, when the aluminum is completely in solution, uh, it, is, it has a different crystal structure from when it forms this compound Ni3Al. So here we have a mixture of aluminum and nickel atoms distributed randomly. So these light blue atoms basically represent an averaged aluminum or nickel atom, okay? Uh, now, this is confusing because you would have thought that we have lost all long range periodicity. Because, you know, if I had a nickel atom here and then I go to an aluminum atom here, I may not necessarily have a nickel atom here. Uh, I might have another aluminum atom. So, in a random uh, solid solution, you have actually lost long range periodicity. But nevertheless, when we do diffraction experiments, et cetera, we pick up really quite sharp uh, peaks in X-ray diffraction or electron diffraction. And the reason is that they are not as sharp as would be the case for pure nickel or pure aluminum. Uh, what happens is that when you add solutes to the matrix, they cause localized strain, and that is reflected in um, um, the lattice parameter, of course, but uh, that's a combined effect of all the solute atoms. But around each solute atom, you also have strains which are heterogeneous and therefore they lead to a slight broadening of the peaks. Uh, so we regard this as a crystal, even though we don't have this strict definition of long range periodicity. The same could happen you know, if one of the atoms was missing, if there was a vacancy, then we disrupted the long range order, but not the essence of the problem. So on the left is the disordered solution of aluminum and nickel. And on the right, we have the compound Ni3Al, in which the aluminum atoms are at the corners of the cell and the nickel atoms are at the face centers. Now, the crystal structure on the left is correctly identified as face centered cubic, right? cubic F, because we assume that this average atom 
um, is uh, of aluminum and nickel uh, is identical everywhere in the cell and therefore the environments here and here and here are identical so this is one atom per lattice point one average atom per lattice point of the cubic half system and therefore this is face centered cubic this no longer is face centered cubic because the environment of the atom here is not the same as the environment of the atom here. Uh, we have uh, a structure which is primitive cubic with a motif of an aluminum atom and three nickel atoms associated with each lattice point of the primitive cubic lattice. So this is very important because these two crystal structures are similar but not identical. And when this precipitate gamma prime forms inside the matrix, uh, because their lattice parameters are not so different, they form in a cube-cube orientation. In other words, the cube edges are completely aligned. Nevertheless, a dislocation coming in from the matrix and getting into the gamma prime has difficulties because when it does so, it will disrupt the ordering of atoms in the cell. So we need another dislocation from the matrix to join it so that the region of disorder between the two dislocations is reduced. And there are partial dislocations inside the gamma prime, but lattice vectors inside the gamma. So this, the, the need for a pair of dislocations to penetrate this compound so that you don't create a very large region of disorder, uh, is a contribution to the hardening of the alloy. So even though the crystal structures match quite nicely at their edges and so forth, there is a resistance for dislocations to penetrate into the ordered compound. So this is called order hardening. Okay, so we've seen how we can generate crystal structures starting with a basic lattice and then placing clusters or individual atoms at each of the lattice points. Now, just to remind you, uh, we had this terminology in the last lecture that a dyad is a twofold axis of rotation. There's a, a rotation of 180 degrees about that axis to reproduce completely the original structure. Uh, a triad is a threefold axis of rotation. That means a rotation of 120 degrees recovers the original structure. Similarly, a tetrad is a 90 degree rotation and a hexad is a 60 degree rotation about the axis. And uh, I explained to you that a uh, very simple mathematical proof that we cannot, for example, have a five-fold or a seven-fold axis of symmetry because if we operate that axis, it doesn't produce an integral number of these spacings. Okay. So we have dyads, triads, tetrads, and hexads, and those are the rotation axes that uh, we will be concerned with. And this is illustrating the operation of a tetrad, a fourfold axis of symmetry. If I rotate by 90 degrees, I recover the structure here. Uh, and uh, this is a mirror plane. Okay, so today we are not going to consider any translational elements of symmetry, okay? Uh, so we, we won't talk about screw dyads or glide planes. Okay, um, uh, in addition, of course, we, we talked about a center of symmetry. So let's look at a molecule of water, right? So here is our molecule of water, and you can clearly see that there is a dyad here this, okay, a two-fold axis of rotation. And there is also a mirror plane which is parallel to the dyad. So the notation that we use to define that point group, in other words, the group of symmetry elements passing through a single point so that the operation of those elements has no effect at all on that point, right? That's why it's called a point group. So the point group for this molecule is 2m, 2 meaning a dyad, and M meaning a mirror plane that is parallel to the dyad. Now, in chemistry, they 
say that this is a point group 2 mm and the reason is that there's another mirror plane which passes through the centers of all these three atoms in other words in the plane of this board uh, but it's only um, a mirror plane because the electron clouds associated with this molecule are not isotropic okay i mean we wouldn't consider it to be an additional mirror plane if it was just passing through these three atoms but the electron clouds give it the additional mirror plane. Also, uh, I'm using a different notation here from the notation used by chemists because you will see in later lectures that we need to include translational elements of symmetry, which the chemists, uh, the notation used in chemistry uh, does not include. Now, why am I bothered about the point group symmetry of a molecule of water? Well, the molecule of water has certain uh, vibrational modes, and these will produce particular frequencies in a spectrum of frequencies that you measure. Okay? If another molecule has the same point group symmetry, then you will be able to see that set of frequencies in the spectrum of that molecule as well. So for example, this is sulfur tetrafluoride. And you can see that there's a twofold axis passing through it and a mirror plane uh, parallel to the plane of the board, roughly. Uh, so the point group again is 2m. So it will have those vibrational modes that the water molecule has uh, producing certain lines in the spectrum, uh, frequency spectrum. It may also have additional vibration modes because it is it has a more complex molecule than that of water. So you can use point group symmetries to understand spectroscopy of chemical species. This is a picture of gigantic crystals of gypsum, which were discovered in a cave in Mexico. So just to understand the scale, this is a man here. Now, gypsum is actually used quite a lot in the construction industry for cement and for plasterboards and so forth. And what I want to do is to look at the detailed shape of these um, crystals and therefore work out which crystal class it belongs to without doing any experiments like diffraction etc just measurements of the shape of that crystal so if i play this movie that will give you a better perspective of the three-dimensional shape of uh, this crystal Now, uh, two things to point out. The first is that the angle between 1 bar 10 and 110 is not exactly 90 degrees. It's somewhat close to 90 degrees, but not exactly. And notice also that these faces are different from these faces. Therefore, the only rotation axis that I can identify is one pointing normal to the 0, 1, 0 phase. And it has to be a dyad because these faces are not identical to that. So there's a dyad normal to the 0, 1, 0 phase. Now, in addition, there's also a mirror plane, which is parallel to the O, 1, O phase. So the dyad is actually at 90 degrees to the mirror plane. Therefore, the notation that we use for the point group is 2 over m, indicating that the dyad is normal to the mirror plane. Now, there is only one dyad and one mirror plane, and it cannot be, for example, orthorhombic, which requires three dyads. So we can immediately say that this 
belongs to the monoclinic crystal class just by looking at its equilibrium shape. Okay? And this is how uh, crystallography was done in the very old days before the modern techniques uh, or not so modern techniques of diffraction, etc., became available. So gypsum has a point group symmetry 2 upon m and it belongs to the monoclinic crystal class. Okay, so this is the sketch of the crystal of gypsum, which was made in 1682. This is a simplified version of that sketch. And what we want to do is to find the point group symmetry of this shape. So if I first play a movie to show you uh, a better perspective of the crystal. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm rotating the crystal about that edge, uh, about an axis normal to that edge. So you can see that 180 degree rotation recovers the original shape, which means that there is a dyad normal to this line here this edge pointing outside of the plane of the diagram. And similarly, there will be a diode passing through the other edge. Now you can see more easily the diode that is passing vertically through this crystal. And therefore, we end up with a point group, which is three diodes. There are no mirror planes or any other symmetry elements to identify. So the point group symmetry of this is two, 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 okay? So there are three dyads. By looking at our table of defining symmetries, that means that the crystal is orthorhombic. So once again, we didn't need to use any fancy techniques, simply looking at the macroscopic shape of the crystal. Now, in our department tea room, right in the corner, there is a, a set of um, modern, futuristic, whatever you like to call them, chess pieces. Okay? And uh, one day when you have a chance, have a look at those chess pieces and see if you can work out their point group symmetries. So here, for example, is the bishop. And it doesn't look like a normal bishop you would associate with chess, but that's fine. Uh, it's a different uh, kind of a chess set. And you can see that there is a threefold axis passing through that red point and normal to this uh, diagram. And in addition, there's a mirror plane there. So the mirror plane, uh, the threefold axis of rotation is parallel to that mirror plane. So the point group symmetry is 3M. Okay. And since there is only one triad, this cannot be cubic. Uh, so the other system which has a triad uh, is um, trigonal. So this has trigonal symmetry. The point group 3M belongs to that class. If you look at the castle, it appears uh, more symmetrical. So there's a fourfold axis passing uh, vertically downwards. And that is uh, the highest symmetry of this object. Um, then, so the first symbol in our point group will be this high order axis, which is, which will identify uh, as the first symbol in the set of point, uh, point group elements. Then we look for symmetry elements that are normal to that axis. So here, for example, uh, mirror planes, but those mirror planes are exactly equivalent. So it only counts as one mirror plane because the operation of the fourfold axis reproduces the other mirror plane. So we have a point groups four and an M because the mirror plane is parallel to that axis. And we can also find another set of mirror planes which are independent uh, there. And therefore, the point group symmetry is 4MM. Now there is only one fourfold axis and therefore this belongs to the tetragonal class. 
even when we look at precipitates in the electron microscope, so very small precipitates, which are formed uh, in the liquid, for example, and therefore they have more or less their equilibrium shapes, we can work out uh, their symmetry. So here, for example, is an aluminum nitride crystal. You can see the scale is one micrometer here. So this is taken in an electron microscope. And we can immediately say that this precipitate in steel, aluminum nitride in steel, uh, belongs to the hexagonal class. Uh, and it is indeed true that aluminum nitride has a hexagonal lattice. Uh, this is a, a mineral that I photographed at the Colorado School of Mines, and this is its idealized shape. Uh, and you can see that it's hexagonal. Okay, so we can say that this belongs to the hexagonal crystal class. So this table is extremely useful in identifying the particular class to which uh, an object uh, crystal belongs. And uh, let me just revise a little bit on how we arrived at the point groups symbols. So when we have objects with low symmetries, that means they do not have uh, X, rotation axis higher than a diet, then we label the point group symbols as follows, that first we identify the rotation axis here, and then uh, independent symmetry elements normal to that. You know, a mirror plane is identified by its normal, so this normal to the mirror plane is at 90 degrees to that axis. And the point group symbol of this object is 2mm. And that completely defines, you, you know, there may be other symmetry elements, but they are redundant. If you label the point group according to the notation here, x, y, and z, then the problem is solved. That gives you the point group symmetry. And you don't need to mention any other elements. Now, the number of... Uh, elements in the point group might be smaller than that, but it's never necessary to have more than three. So this is for the older crystal classes uh, below tetragonal that do not have, uh, you know, triads or tetrads or hexads. When we do have uh, objects with uh, higher symmetries, for example, a fourfold axis, we always place that high, high rotation axis, high symmetry rotation axis as the first symbol here. And then we identify two that are normal, but independent. So here is our fourfold axis. And obviously we have mirror plane here and mirror plane here. Okay. But these two are not independent. So that just gives us one M. And then there's another set of mirror planes here. Uh, whose normals are also at 90 degrees to the rotation axis, and that gives us the symbol 4mm. Okay. Now, just looking at this object, you can see that there is no center of symmetry because the top surface has a different topology from the bottom. So this point group belongs to the tetragonal system because it has one four-fold uh, axis, but it does not have a center of symmetry. So you can have a variety of point groups in a particular uh, crystal class, depending on the locations of atoms within the cell and so forth. So here is the entire list of 32 point groups. Uh, the system of deriving these point groups uh, has exceptions. So in the case of a cube, it is so important to have four triads, four threefold axes of symmetry, that the middle symbol is always a triad. Okay? You can see in all of these uh, notations for the cubic class, we have the non central symmetric, the central symmetric, you always have a triad in the middle or as long as you have uh, three of these. Okay? Um, bar six simply means a rotation and an inversion, a, a, a rotation by 60 degrees followed by an inversion uh, and, uh, and so on. 
And six over M means uh, the hex head is normal to the mirror plane. And when we have two additional mirror planes, uh, instead of writing six divided by M and then MM, we use a short notation that this hex head is normal to that mirror plane, but parallel to these two, okay? So practice will make perfect. Um, this is not as uh, complicated as it looks. Uh, point groups are extremely useful in determining the properties of crystals. So for example, uh, when we had uh, the, uh, I forget, was it uh, gypsum which was 4mm or epsomite? Yeah, epsomite. Uh, so that had tetragonal symmetry 4mm, but there is no center of symmetry. So if you take that crystal and uh, study it under deformation, you will see that it's piezoelectric because during that deformation, charges are not displaced evenly and therefore you get uh, an electrical response. So properties like piezoelectricity can be used in addition to the shape to really pin down more about the symmetry of the structure. Okay, that's uh, all for today. And in the next lecture, we will continue on this theme, but uh, move on to stereographic projections.